Good afternoon. I'm Christine Miller, Executive Director of the Utah State University Honors Program, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all, students, alumni, faculty, administrators, staff, friends, and community members, to the 45th Annual Honors Last Lecture. A special welcome to all of you students who are here today actively taking the Honors Dare to Know. Each year, our students nominate professors who have made an impact on their lives for the award of Honors Outstanding Professor of the Year. A committee of Honors students interviews finalists and decides upon one outstanding professor who then imagines and delivers what might be a last lecture if that professor had only one more to give. We are so pleased today to hear from our 2020 Honors Outstanding Professor, Dr. Seth Archer from the Department of History in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. I'd like to extend special thanks to the students who served on this year's Honors Last Lecture Committee. Those students were co-chairs Isaac Dixon and Maddie MacArthur, and committee members Sierra Benson, Eliza Owens, and David Swiss. I'd also like to thank the USU Honors Program staff and the Performance Hall team for their extensive planning and work behind the scenes to make this virtual event run smoothly. It is now my pleasure to introduce Executive Vice President and Provost Francis Gailey, who will share a bit about the history of the USU Honors Program last, last lecture, and then introduce the honor student who originally nominated Dr. Seth Archer to deliver the 45th annual Honors Last Lecture. Provost Gailey, thank you for your support of the University Honors Program and for taking the time to join us for this special virtual event today. Thank you, Chris. It is my pleasure to be here with all of you today and to support the 45th annual Honors Last Lecture. The last lecture is the University Honors Program's annual celebration of world-class teaching and research that sets Utah State University's faculty apart. Each year since 1976, honors students have nominated and interviewed professors who have changed their academic lives in fundamental ways. We're delighted today to hear from the student committee selection for the 2020 Honors Outstanding Professor, Dr. Seth Archer from the Department of History in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Since every honors last lecturer is a beloved professor, and as Chris mentioned just a minute ago, it's important to remember that this is not actually Dr. Archer's last lecture. We hope that you will continue talking with students and colleagues here at Utah State University for many years to come. Because this event is fundamentally student-driven, the Honors Program has asked an Honors student to introduce Dr. Ad Archer today. I'm pleased to introduce Meridian Wapit. Meridian is a junior in the University Honors Program studying conservation and restoration ecology and agriculture and natural resources pre-law. She works as the Director of Advocacy on the Executive Residence Hall Association Board, the Media Director on Darren Perry's Congressional Camp Campaign and District 1, and trip leader for Utah State University's outdoor programs. In her free time, you can find Meridian rowing some of America's biggest whitewater rivers, doing conservation research, registering students to vote, running away on wild outdoor adventures, and volunteering with various groups across campus. She's a proud Aggie and excited for the opportunity to introduce Dr. Archer today. It is my pleasure now to present Meridian Wapit, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Provost Gailey. I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to the 45th Annual Honors Last Lecture, and I'm excited to be here to introduce the 2020 Honors Outstanding Professor. I first met Dr. Archer last year when I enrolled in an Honors Think Tank course entitled Health, Society, and Culture, Past and Present. I signed up for the class originally because the name sounded cool, but I soon fell in love with the course. The course introduced me to the historical and sociological study of health through intensive reading, writing, discussion, and research. We focused in particular on socio-historical factors that have shaped health patterns and created disparities in illness and health care. The class discussions in which I participated in truly broadened my perspective and opened my eyes to numerous issues related to health care and health in the Americas, both past and present. Once COVID hit and the university moved to remote instruction, our discussion started to focus around healthcare in America today and how we are handling the COVID-19 crisis. This allowed me to think critically about the problems our country faced early in the pandemic and potential solutions that we could have implemented. 
I won't lie, this was absolutely my favorite course last semester. And I think in a large part because of Dr. Archer being so passionate about the material we were covering, which really allowed students to open up and share their honest thoughts on readings and complex subjects. In addition to the history of health, disease, and medicine, Dr. Archer teaches courses on early American and 19th century U.S., Native American, and environmental history. From 2015 to 2017, he was a Mellon Research Fellow at the Amer in American History at the University of Cambridge. His first book was Sharks Upon the Land, Colonialism, Indigenous Health, and Cultures in Hawaii, 1778 through 1855, which won the President's Book Award from the Social Science History Association. And with all of that, it is my great honor to introduce the 2020 Honors Last Lecturer, Dr. Seth Archer. It's customary in my field to acknowledge the indigenous people on whose homelands we reside. Depending where you are, this is not always simple, given the complexity and contested nature of territory in the past. But Cache Valley is straightforward. I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Shoshone Nation. For eons, bands of Shoshone people took sustenance from the mountains and valleys of the Great Basin. They called the land mother, and the relationship was a sacred one. I want to acknowledge that relationship and the Shoshones who nourished it and who continue to sustain it against increasingly long odds in this age of climate change and other existential threats. I'd also like to thank the Honors Program team, Chris Miller, Andy Lightoff, Justina Adams, Emma Halleck, Amanda Addison, and the Student Selection Committee. Thanks to Provost Gailey for his comments and to Celestin Lendor and her design team for creating the poster. Thanks to Honors student Meridian Wapit for nominating and introducing me today. And thanks to Dr. Guadalupe Marquez Velarde for collaborating with me on the honors course that Meridian mentioned and for teaching me so much about the world we live in as opposed to the worlds of the past. I appreciate all of you and I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak. When I proposed this topic in mid-March, I thought I knew a few things about public health that my audience would not. Now it's October. And the truth is we're all public health experts, at least in the narrow terms of the epidemic. We all know about quarantine, testing, contact tracing, and community spread. I'm not an epidemiologist or a health professional, but I've spent some time thinking about past epidemics. And I'd like to shed some light on our current predicament with some perspective from the past. The American public increasingly skeptical of experts, also struggles to understand the work that professional historians do. As my students know, the job of a historian is not to record names and dates or rehearse facts and figures. What we do, for the most part, is ask questions about the past. And in trying to answer those questions, we conduct research and construct arguments. The historical question driving my current research is why did the United States launch a costly vaccination campaign on behalf of people it had targeted for ethnic cleansing? The people were Native Americans and Indian removal, as it was known, was one of the central aims of the federal government in the 1830s. I'm not the first to ask this question, but I'm not satisfied with previous answers. And I have a number of other questions that scholars have not explored. These have to do with the role of Native people in the campaign and their health outcomes after the vaccine. I argue that this campaign was the U.S. discovery of public health and that American Indians were largely responsible for its success. So that's where we're headed today. But first, some thoughts on where we are nine months into the U.S. epidemic. Let's start with Utah State. From everything I've seen, the university has done an outstanding job. I'm grateful for the long hours and really heroic efforts by administration and staff over the summer, no less, 
to bring us back to campus and keep us all enrolled and employed. Almost none of us had experience living through an epidemic. And it's impressive, touching really, to see these efforts university-wide, including by students who have shown real grit in taking personal responsibility for the well-being of us all. The state of Utah has done less well, but let's stick with the positives for a moment. New therapies to reduce mortality and keep people out of hospital and a handful of vaccines show real promise. Despite the politicization of the whole process, we can cautiously hope that one or more vaccines will prove safe and effective sometime next year. There's apparently no shortage of government and private funding, and American ingenuity and innovation might well save the day. But there are questions, and a few have probably occurred to you. How well will the vaccine work? In other words, what kind of immunity will it offer? Given the desperation, the bar on efficacy is low. Who will take it? We won't know for a year or more what it takes to reach herd immunity, which is the level of immunity in a given population to slow the spread of the virus. I've seen estimates ranging from 25 to 70 percent. If less than 60 percent of the population takes the vaccine, say, and it turns out herd immunity requires 70 percent, the only alternative I know is infection with its attendant mortality. The novel coronavirus is a clever microbe. With every state and locality free to choose its approach, the epidemic runs wild. With a free pass to cross borders, spike wherever people gather, seek out the maskless, prey on the vulnerable, and exploit our lack of public health infrastructure, including our reliance on foreign manufacturing for the most basic of materials, such as PPE. Add to that the shifting and contradictory messages out of the CDC and FDA, power plays by the executive branch and the Department of Health and Human Services, widespread shortcomings on testing and other supplies, conspiracy theories galore, and some experts apparently muzzled. Most of us grow numb as the body count rises. Meanwhile, University of Washington researchers tell us that by the end of 2020, the U.S. epidemic won't even be half over. By February 1st, they predict U.S. mortality will approximate the 9-11 terrorist attacks for 133 days straight. Picture that for a moment. The World Trade Center's falling, more than 1,000 people in lower Manhattan perishing day after day for four and a half months. The U.S. struggle with COVID is noteworthy, and not just our shortcomings in public health measures. The groundswell of racial justice activism this summer probably seemed to many observers unrelated to the epidemic, but it wasn't. I'm hardly the first to note that for too many communities, the assault on their lives and bodies has been multi-pronged. The apparatus of the state, on one hand, and the impact of a mindless, colorblind virus, on the other. Child mortality has been low, but that's little consolation to families who lost theirs. The latest figures show as many as 80% of these deaths were children of color. Here's where public health blurs into population health. Well before COVID, the U.S. performed poorly on various measures of population health, which is simply health outcomes measured across groups. The U.S. is typically compared to Western European nations, but you might be surprised to learn that our health outcomes actually mirror those of nations like Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. Historically speaking, our response to this health crisis is the kind that gets a nation downgraded by human rights groups on measures of basic competency and responsibility. 
So as we race to the bottom with India and Brazil in COVID casualties, it's impossible not to see this as a measure of our place in the world. Certainly the rest of the world is measuring us. And that's just on the federal level. A few weeks ago, I woke to find an empty takeout bag hanging from my front door with a note stapled to it asking for donations for local schools. That might strike you as perfectly natural, just the local control of education by design, or even the better angels of our civic responsibility in action. But I see it differently. Nine months into a pandemic, the wealthiest nation on earth is unable to provide basic sanitary supplies. We're talking about disinfecting wipes and hand sanitizer. So citizens are being asked for charity, as the note called it. It reminded me of friends and colleagues who chipped in to, to provide food, rent, and basic supplies for the families of workers at the meat processing plant in Hiram way back in June, when another vulnerability in our safety net was exposed. Local struggles, of course, stem from the lack of state and federal strategies and a public health apparatus that's fallen flat on its face. Here's another unusual pairing. What enables Taiwan to enjoy these results for cases and deaths from what is essentially a crowd disease, while Utah, with a much lower population and a much larger land mass, suffers from these. Federalism is the idea that state and local jurisdictions maintain their authority and offer their consent to the union and its limited powers over them. It's a founding principle of this nation. Coronavirus is the Achilles heel of federalism. As a historian, it's bad for business to suggest that my work lacks clear lessons, but the past is complicated and my story presents more of a puzzle or a paradox than a single explanation. Hopefully it's an illustrative puzzle, but either way, I think it helps explain why the US for all its strength proves woefully inadequate in healthcare and public health more specifically. The story begins with an infectious virus, like coronavirus, probably zoonotic in origin, that disproportionately affected American Indians and began spreading across the North American interior. That's the Mississippi River running north-south through the circle. And the Mississippi was the western boundary of the US at this time. Reports from federal agents poured into the War Department, which was in charge of Indian Affairs. And eventually Congress approved legislation to vaccinate. This was the first vaccine and the US was late to employ it. Europe had begun vaccinating not only its citizens or subjects, but also colonized and frontier populations from as early as 1802. The vaccine itself was developed in 1796. Local people's receptiveness varied, but I should add that vaccination really took off in some regions, including British occupied India, where it initially competed with an older form of inoculation known as variolation. This was also true in North Africa. Back in North America, US military surgeons were dispatched to Indian agencies and villages. Civilian surgeons and physicians were employed by the government on a freelance basis. Because pay required documentation, the records of these vaccinators are fairly thorough. And this map shows a few clusters of vaccinations that I've been researching. Native Americans not only directed the government along the road to this discovery of public health, they also made the campaign successful due to their willingness to try something new. By 1840, 
tens of thousands of people across a vast expanse of territory had received the potentially life-saving treatment against the most lethal disease to ever strike their communities. Indian removal was a moral and legal catastrophe. For many Native people today, and for a growing number of non-Natives, the United States simply cannot earn legitimacy as a nation while it occupies stolen homelands. The past half century has seen amends around the edges, but the real reckoning over this ethnic cleansing has yet to take place. It's also difficult to represent in a static map because it occurred over many years and involved many, many displacements. I actually had to find two maps to represent all the groups affected. Vaccination, you might have noticed, fits awkwardly within this broader narrative of US empire. This is one reason no one has thought to trace the origins of American public health to it. Most scholars of public health begin the story in the 1880s with the rise of the germ theory of disease and microbiology. After all, what kind of public health program can operate without understanding the most fundamental cause of disease? Meanwhile, scholars of the campaign have discussed it in one of two ways, as a coercive act of biopower by the US, or as a half-hearted, short-lived, and minimally effective public relations ploy to win the goodwill of the anti-removal voters and to a lesser extent of Native Americans themselves. There is some truth in both views, but neither really explains why the campaign was conceived, how it operated, or what the results were. Most importantly, for my purposes, neither of these views explains the role of Native people in the campaign. I want to be clear, Indian removal was genocidal policy. Thousands died and as many as 80,000 American Indians were torn from their ancestral homelands. Vaccination was in no way a form of redress, nor did it set the stage for a broader public health apparatus, except within the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and even that in a limited fashion. The public whose health the U.S. discovered were considered dependents or wards of the state. The relationship was paternalistic, racist, and imperial. Yet certain things were required of the empire, and these included medicine and other health provisions. As for why the U.S. didn't discover public health for its own citizens, not only public health, but healthcare generally was simply beyond its purview. The one exception was the military. Public health measures such as quarantines and sanitation were strictly local matters. Vaccination was available in some regions. People in New England and the Mid-Atlantic states were broadly protected from smallpox by this time, but the government played almost no role. There's one alternative for the U.S. discovery of public health, which I should mention. It also relates to smallpox, and it helps illustrate the limits of federal intervention into the health of its citizens. Following the European precedent, Congress during the War of 1812 passed an act to encourage vaccination. It was mostly toothless, poorly funded, and dogged from the start by concerns about, guess what? Federalism. Actually, the act created a one-man operation. When that man sent faulty vaccine through the mail, 10 people died in North Carolina. Congress used the accident as an excuse to repeal the act outright. So if 1813 was the discovery of public health, it was stillborn. For critics, it was proof that the people's health was not the business of the federal government and might be unconstitutional. What the government should be doing is fighting the British, or at least preventing them from torching the capital. 
you can see the smoke damage around the windows of the Capitol building in this image. To return to 1832, there's one other aspect of the campaign that could be said to bear on today's events. The 22nd Congress was sharply divided between those who supported Andrew Jackson and those who didn't. Nearly half the country despised him. A president who had demeaned the office by appointing untrained cronies, acting vindictively, and promoting violence. Many Americans, especially Northerners, viewed his policy of Indian removal with horror, as a breach of trust and as a stain on the nation. The War Department, however, which was responsible for removal, had grown into a formidable agency with a professional bureaucracy and experienced officers. For a government designed to be decentralized and weak, the War Department stood out as an exception. The Indian office within that department had evolved to be able to do many things, and running a public health campaign was one of them. While Native Americans were typically viewed through the barrel of a gun by the War Department, tens of thousands ended up as targets of a different kind of government attention beginning in 1832. So I've given you a taste of how the government found itself in the position of offering preventive medicine to people they were sim simultaneously trying to expel from the nation. There were other factors. There had been a lot of turnover in Congress between the Removal Act in 1830 and vaccination two years later. So different congressmen voting on these two issues. There was the growth of a professional bureaucracy, the Indian office, that felt obligated to act rather, th rather than turn a blind eye on the epidemic. There was a desire to avoid chaos on the frontier in places like this, where valuable trade was carried on with natives and with major removal operations already underway. Vaccination actually would have occurred at places just like this. And finally, I suggest that vaccination was a form of humanitarianism that coexisted with empire. The evidence for this is that many congressmen voted both for removal and for vaccination. One question that may have occurred to you is whether this was a form of medical experimentation. It's unlikely. Vaccination was already gospel for most physicians. It was never without risks and therefore controversy, but very few American physicians doubted its efficacy and almost all of them understood how it worked. So there wasn't anything to be learned by vaccinating native people. The primary goal was simply to immunize them. Of course, some Native Americans declined vaccination, but I haven't found a single community that abstained as a whole. Many communities were vaccinated in full. Even when warned against it by trading partners, American Indians chose to be vaccinated. A group in Ohio actually demanded it before they would allow the government to remove them. Some native leaders, such as Little Soldier here, encouraged vaccination of their people. An effective strategy was to go first, as the Caw Chief White Plume did. Others chose to play it safe and go last. People of all ages, male and female, were vaccinated, as were bicultural families, Joe Jim Jr., who was of French and Osage descent, was vaccinated with his adopted Caw people on the Kansas River in 1832. He was 10 years old at the time and became the uncle of a future U.S. vice president. Both men were related to White Plume from the previous slide. 
Government surgeons encouraged American Indians to vaccinate themselves, and some did. More than that, there's evidence that they passed the technique along to friends and allies. That may not sound surprising to you, but the assumption of scholars in my field is that Native Americans would have rejected any form of government intervention into their health and well-being, and even reject Western medicine outright. That assumption is incorrect. In my research, I've also identified a number of communities that in all likelihood developed herd immunity to smallpox. This includes various Dakota or Sioux bands, the Kaw Nation of Kansas, and Ojibwe's in Minnesota and Wisconsin. This is an important finding because it means that some native nations were protected when smallpox struck again in 1836. The Great Plains smallpox epidemic of 1836 to 40 was the worst epidemic of the 19th century in North America. And it appears here on a Lakota pictorial history known as a winter count. There is no doubt that morbidity and mortality to smallpox would have been considerably higher without the vaccinations of the 1830s. Remarkably, some in government worked to protect the health of undesirable non-citizens who happened to be vulnerable to the disease. To the extent that they were successful, it was because those non-citizens advocated for themselves and for their neighbors and were willing to take a chance on a new form of preventive medicine. It's important to emphasize that Native people survived. As you can see here, Lakota history did not end with smallpox in 1838. Life continued with Sitting Bull becoming chief, the first battle with American soldiers, the year that new ceremonial headdresses were woven, and peace with their former enemies, the Assiniboan Indians. Finally, for some native nations, such as the Lakotas and Western Dakotas, increased resistance to smallpox may have contributed to a broader resistance to US empire and the persistence of their sovereignty into the late 19th century. This is a line of argument I'm currently developing. If anyone at the time noticed the immunological effects of the rising Lakotas and Dakotas, that knowledge had long since been forgotten when the Sioux Wars broke out in 1854. Nor have historians noticed this factor. Other nations, such as the Ojibwe's, who reaped the benefits of vaccination in 1832, proceeded to negotiate vaccine and other health provisions into their later removal treaties. We've all heard the global health crisis described as unprecedented. It feels that way, I'll grant you. The suffering is real and ongoing, and I would never want to make light of it. But I think the story I've told shows just how precedented COVID-19 is, and maybe for reasons you hadn't considered before. The fact that a genocidal government managed to protect tens of thousands of people along a remote and potentially dangerous border seems to me a profound indictment of our own nation's response to the current epidemic. Rather than discovering public health, as I suggest in the title of this talk, it may be more appropriate to say that the United States of 1832 stumbled upon it. Nearly two centuries later, we continue to stumble. Thank you. I look forward to our discussion. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Carrie Holt. I'm a professor in the English department. And I am pleased to welcome you all to our live Q&A for Dr. Archer's talk. I'll be the moderator. If you will submit your questions through the Q&A uh, segment in the webinar, and I will pose those questions to Dr. Archer. So for our first question, we have someone who uh, had noticed that you mentioned that this was the first vaccine. So can you talk a little bit about what the vaccine was and how it was discovered or developed? 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. It's a long and complicated story, but it's, it's easily found even on Wikipedia. The physician, his name was Edward Jenner. He was an English country physician. And for a long time in, the rural, in rural England, people were aware that dairy, ma dairy maids did not catch smallpox. And so there were all kinds of theories about this, essentially folk wisdom, um, but it was based in fact. And the reason they didn't catch smallpox is, was because they were contracting cowpox, which is a related disease. There's all kinds of pox diseases, um, monkey pox, raccoon pox, chicken pox is not a, a pox virus, but it, it has a confusing name. But in any case, there are all kinds of pox viruses and um, they're very similar. They're, they're genetically quite similar. So if you catch one, if you, if you can catch one, it will offer you immunity against another. So Edward Jenner experimented in a way that um, would not be ethical today, certainly not legal, um, although he, he was um, close family friends with, uh, with the family who he experimented on, and he simply um, exposed them to cowpox and then exposed them to smallpox, and sure enough, uh, they didn't catch it. So the the vaccine was originally just cowpox, although it was used so frequently and traveled literally around the world that it crossed with other pox viruses, including we think horse pox, possibly camel pox, to the point that it was no longer cowpox. And so, so at some point it was just vaccinia virus. Again, this is a complicated story, but Essentially, that's the origin of it um, in the late in the 1790s. And as I mentioned in the talk, it caught on incredibly fast. And a number of uh, European nations, empires, spread this preventive medicine literally around the world. The Spanish launched an enormous vaccination campaign all through the Americas and the Philippines in 1802, just just five years after the um, vaccine was developed. So this was it. Um, vac vaccine comes from the root word for cow, vaca. So um, the only reason we call vaccines vaccines today um, was because later, um, later scientists were honoring Edward Jenner um, by recognizing that this was the first vaccine. Um, so that's it, that's the story. All right, so for the next question is, um, could you say a little bit more about the primary sources for understanding how indigenous communities responded to these smallpox epidemics in the 1830s? What are these sources? Where do you find them? And what challenges do you face in reading them? Oh, that's a great question. Um, innumerable challenges, but the short answer is that I'm working with the papers of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which are housed in the National Archives. Uh, on microfilm, which is, uh, which is not fun to read, especially not 19th century handwriting on microfilm. But as I said in the talk, these surgeons who were being paid sort of by the vaccination, um, or at least by the day, had to record everything in order to be paid. So they did. Um, so we, we know the names of, of hundreds, thousands of indigenous people who were uh, vaccinated but no one's ever looked through the records to try to figure out who those people are. Um, and so that's what I did last summer, it was, was actually go through those records. Um, in some cases we know, in all cases we know their names and their ages, in some cases we know uh, their sex. And um, you can often figure out the relations between people based on the order they're vaccinated and based on their ages. For instance, White Plume, who was a, a chief of the Kaw Nation whom I mentioned, was vaccinated um, the first of his people. Um, his wife was vaccinated next, and their 11 children were vaccinated after them. I, you can just see it on, on the log. So it's, it's a surprisingly rich source um, that was obviously created by the government. This project's new to me. I, I've only been working on it for a year. And so what I haven't done yet is um, look for indigenous documentation. Um, whether oral traditions or actual documentation that's been passed down through the generations. I'm not entirely optimistic that I'll find a lot because the truth is uh, this campaign was forgotten. It was forgotten by everybody, it seems, um, to the extent that, as I mentioned in the talk, 
when the Sioux Wars broke out in the 1850s, which were some of the, the biggest wars that the U.S. Army fought in North America, no one had any memory of the fact that Dakota and Lakota people had been vaccinated at a higher rate than anyone else in North America. And I'm not saying that their resistance, um, their resistance to imperialism was based on their vaccination, but it didn't, ha it didn't hurt. And their numbers certainly um, were, were growing in the 1850s, and they were powerful people. And um, only 20 years after being vaccinated, no one seemed to remember that. Um, so the short answer is I'm looking at government documents. Um, the more uh, in the future, what I'm going to do is um, talk with indigenous people and visit indigenous communities and try to figure out what records or memory uh, people have of, of, of this of this relatively short-lived experiment um, in the 1830s. All right, for our next question, why do you think the current response to the pandemic and the eventual vaccine has been so negative? And do you believe there's anything the government can do to change this outlook? I wish I could say that the government could do something to to change the course we're on. Um, in, in the long term, of course, they can. In the short term, the problem is the virus is running wild. And um, there are nations that, that got this under control. Um, I mentioned Taiwan in the talk. Um, New Zealand's got it under control. Um, South Korea seems to, um, even China. Um, but since we didn't get under, under control when we could have, um, the the prospects for um, for controlling it in the short term are 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 slim. What we could do is have a revamped public health infrastructure uh, in this country, um, but that's going to take a lot of uh, will of of not only Congress um, but the American people. And one thing we have going against us, as I mentioned multiple times in the talk, I think it's probably the biggest thing we have going against us, is that we're designed on, on, on federalism. And I, I guess it's that combined with the sacred um, role of liberty in this country, that um, liberty comes first, responsibility is somewhere further down the line. That is responsibility to our fellow citizens, our obligations. Um, we're a nation that, that's all about rights and liberty um, and not about obligations and responsibility. Um, again, unlike some other nations and strikingly unlike indigenous communities, I will say. Um, Native American people have, have responded in dramatically different ways to COVID-19. Um, and they haven't all been successful in keeping the infection out uh, or, and the deaths um, down. But, um, but their priorities are quite different and their priorities are about keeping people healthy and keeping their elders alive. And, um, you know, there's been real, there's been heroic efforts um, from a lot of indigenous communities. Um, they don't show up in the news because, uh, well, there's so much in the news and native people don't typically make the headlines. But, um, but I guess that's, that's my short answer to the difficulty with the federal response and not being a public health professional, not even being a health professional, and certainly not being a policy person, um, I don't know what to recommend right at the moment. Historians are better at sort of diagnosing what's happened than, than what we, we should do going forward. Um, so I wish I could offer more, but I think I'll leave it at that. All right, for the next question, you mentioned that it seems that we continue to stumble on public health even in today's day and age. Looking back on history from our own country and around the world, what would you suggest we do as a nation or as individual citizens to change our standpoint on public health from stumbling around to developing? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that question is kind of a good answer to the last question, um, which is that we need to do something. We need to do something different. Um, you know, short of of, of exploding the federalist model, that is this um, free exchange between states and um, open borders between states, which I don't see that happening anytime soon, and I don't think most Americans would want to do that. So short of doing that, we need public health professionals um, who are well-trained and uh, decently paid, um, and 
in every state and on the federal level. And we need them to take charge when the crisis is a public health crisis as opposed to a political or you know, a diplomatic crisis where we would call on the president or Congress. We need public health experts to, to um, tell us what to do. Um, we can't fix this individually and we can't fix it locally, um, right? So public health, it's, it requires a top-down approach. Um, even in the smallest communities, it requires a top-down approach because um, people have to know what to do and they have to um, sacrifice and someone needs to tell them, <laughs> tell people what their obligations are, what their responsibilities are. And um, I, I hesitate to say that there have to be consequences, but if you think about the things that, that we are fined for, that we are um, imprisoned for in this country in some cases, think about a parking ticket. I mean, no one, no one challenges a parking ticket when they get it. And yet we don't even have we don't even have the, the structure to give someone a COVID-19 violation. I mean, that would, it, would, it would cause an uproar, I think, um, in, in many parts of the country. So, um, so I think it, we need a national strategy. We need um, trained people at the helm. Um, and then we do need a change in culture. We, we need to rethink our responsibilities to one another, our obligations to one another, um, and I think lastly, we need to stop thinking of ourselves as so unique. One of the, prop one of the reasons we got into this mess is because we never thought it could happen in America. Um, well, any public health uh, expert could tell you that um, that was just a pipe dream. Um, there's nothing about Asia that makes it uh, more likely to experience an epidemic. And, and we saw SARS and we saw MERS, we saw um, Ebola um, and so it's easy to say in hindsight, but we should have seen it coming. And um, I think many Americans are surprised at the, um, at the failure of the public health apparatus in this country. So for the next question, uh, were the main indigenous groups that got vaccinated, were they people who were being threatened with, re with removal or were the groups that were vaccinated those that were further away from white settlements? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I was really surprised. It's, it's, a, it's a mix of both. So the story that really got me um, so excited about this project, I mentioned it very, very briefly, one sentence in that talk, was I, I, I found a group of um, Shawnee and Seneca Indians. Um, it, was a, it was a mixed community, um, both of whom had already been removed. Um, the Senecas are from upstate New York. The Shawnees are from the Ohio Valley. In 1832, they are living together in Western Ohio, and they've signed a treaty with the government. Most, most indigenous groups who were ethnically cleansed had signed treaties. Now, almost all of these treaties were um, cynical, and people were um, signing them in dire straits, and, and sometimes people without authority were signing them on behalf of um, native communities. But in any case, the Senecas and Shawnees had signed a treaty and that treaty said that they should be that they were to be removed. Well, somehow they heard about the Congressional Vaccination Act, and they demanded of the Indian agent that he vaccinate them before he removed them. And when I saw that, I just thought, oh my gosh, people in the midst of in the midst of an ethnic cleansing are thinking about their own health and calling on the government to um, make good on its promise um, to to vaccinate them. So that's remarkable, and that's an example of a group that was being removed um, when they were vaccinated. But actually, most of these groups were out west. Most of them were west of the Mississippi, um, living on the Kansas River, living along the Missouri River, um, living on the Great Plains. And these government surgeons, um, I mean, they traveled far and wide to, um, to vaccinate people. And... Um, most of those groups were not slated for imminent removal. Now, everybody knows that as you march through the 19th century, almost all of these groups eventually will be removed to um, Indian territory, which becomes Oklahoma. But in the 1830s, the Ojibwe's were not um, planning to, um, there was no plan to remove them forcibly um, or by choice. There was no plan to remove the um, Kaw people of Kansas, 
no plans to remove the um, Lakotas and Western Dakotas. So most of the groups, in fact, were living out west um, and not slated for removal, but some were in the east and, and were slated for removal. Another enormous vaccination um, campaign occurred among the uh, Muscogee Creeks, who were based in um, the Deep South and who were um, just about to be removed when the vaccinators came through. So yeah, given that sort of removal was a was a federal policy, we have a question here, and this cycles back to something you were addressing earlier. Um, do you think public health efforts are better received when they're implemented locally instead of top down? Um, I think they probably are better received, and I, I assume that the the person is asking about uh, for American people. Um, Certainly, for Americans, they're much better received when, when they're coming on the local level because that is, that's our tradition in this country is local control. Um, it's, it's arguably sacred local control um, and minimal uh, interference by the federal government. The problem is that's not the way public health works. And our, our, you know, we're now in the third wave of an epidemic in this country. And one of the major reasons is that every state is making it up as they go. Um, and the virus just moves from state to state, right? And locality to locality. So when it comes to an epidemic, um, um, local, local public health is not the solution. Now, when it comes to sanitation or, or local quarantines or environmental policy, um, you know, that can work on the local level. But when it comes to epidemics, it, I think this is evidence. Our current, our current situation is evidence that it doesn't work so well. And once again, let me make the comparison with Taiwan. Taiwan has 24 million people. Um, they live on a tiny patch of land right off the coast of China where this virus originated. They have something like 530 cases. Cases, not deaths. Um, seven deaths. Um, the virus, the, the COVID-19 broke out on the same day that it broke out here in, in North America. Um, so they're doing something differently. And this is something Americans are not, um, we're not always attuned to what other countries are doing. And we don't like to compare ourselves with other countries. But, you know, this is a wake up call that uh, other countries are, are handling this differently and better. And so we should learn from them. So here's a question about how U.S. agents explained or talked to indigenous peoples about and about vaccination. Were there patterns in native medical culture that intersected with the logic of the vaccination process? Uh, I love that question. Um, I have so much more research to do on that question, but uh, uh, let me let me let me just point to two things. Um, first of all. As, as I said repeatedly in that talk, the assumption of scholars um, and the general public is that Native Americans would just be resistant to any kind of intervention in their health by, by the government or by outsiders. Well, my research has shown that medicine is like any other commodity. Native people all the way back to the earliest colonial period were interested in what Europeans uh, brought and, and as well as Africans. They were interested in new commodities. They were interested in trade goods and weapons um, and tools. And medicine seems to be, seems to fall into that same pattern. If, if something was useful, if a health measure was useful, native people were interested in it. There was no cultural prescription against, you know, the white man's medicine or, or anything like that. And in fact, inoculation is not even a European medical technology. It originated, we think, in Asia. Um, it dates back many centuries, and this was obviously before the cowpox discovery, when people would inoculate themselves with the actual smallpox virus. They did this in North Africa. They did this in Asia. I believe that um, people who came in the African slave trade um, probably shared the, this, this preventive medicine with um, Europeans. I know they shared it with Europeans. There's a famous story of a Puritan minister learning from it, learning of the technique from an enslaved man. I suspect they also shared it with native people. So 
So it's not even exactly true to say that this was Western medicine or that this was European medicine. One other point about that, most groups on the plains, um, most native groups practiced therapeutic bleeding, that is bloodletting, the same way Europeans did. And they actually used the same kind of instrument that Europeans used to vaccinate. This is gonna confuse people, I realize, but there's no hypodermic needles in 1832. The way they vaccinate is they make a cut on the arm and they insert um, the cowpox material, um, the vaccine, into that cut. Well, native people had no qualms, uh, at least on the plains, with um, using a lancet, with therapeutic bleeding. And so it, it didn't seem to be an issue to have um, someone make a cut on their arm and, and insert a vaccine. Now, they didn't always trust these surgeons, of course, but the actual technique doesn't seem to have um, caused undue concern or not any more than it would have for white Americans who were obviously terrified of vaccines and they still are. Um, uh, in terms, I, I think the other part of that question was about, um, Carrie, can you just remind me, was it about indigenous healers? Yeah, it was about indigenous healers and did they have something sort of aligned with vaccination processes? Right, so the closest, th closest thing I've been able to find is, is this uh, bloodletting. That, that was widely practiced. Um, I have not found any examples of either inoculation uh, with smallpox or um, vaccination before around this era, before the uh, early 19th century. I haven't found that in native communities. All right, and this will be our last question. Um, given sort of the, the challenges that our current public health experts and agencies are facing in dealing with the current pandemic, um, what would you say are some things that we can learn from this example from history and what are some lessons that we can apply as we continue to face the current situation? Yeah, that's a really hard one. Um, the lessons, you know, since I, since I think about this 1830s campaign as a bit of a paradox or a puzzle, you know, it doesn't seem to make sense that, a, that the federal government would be interested in, in protecting these people who, whom it considered non-desirable um, against this disease, right? So in some ways, well, that's a terrible model to think about what Andrew Jackson's government did. Um, how could that possibly provide any lessons for today? And yet, what I'm finding is the War Department had evolved um, into a really sizable agency with um, professional bureaucrats, I guess we could call them, who had learned indigenous languages or hired interpreters to um, be out on the frontier discussing these issues with native groups. There was valuable trade ca being carried on between native groups and, and the federal government. And so there, there are obviously self-interested -interest, reasons why the government would be involved with these people. Um, but does it provide lessons? I think it's more of an indictment that a government like the government of the 1830s, which not only did it not care about native people, it was actively trying to um, expel them from the nation. Um, and yet, when smallpox broke out, people jumped into action. Um, these surgeons were not paid a lot. They were paid something like $6 a day. Um, they were expected to um, vaccinate 100 Indians each day. So what is that? Six cents per vac vaccinee. Um, I don't know what that converts to today, but a couple hundred dollars. Uh, they weren't making a killing. Many of them were quite young, these surgeons. Um, but it was field experience for them. And um, some of them had deep convictions that they were out there saving lives. And they were, actually, um, given that the greatest epidemic of the 19th century would break out in this region only four years later. And these people would have been sitting ducks and tens of thousands more would have sickened and thousands, if not tens of thousands, would have uh, additional people would have died in that epidemic. So um, I, I think it's a testament to um, having people in government who do their jobs, um, who are capable, who um, who feel that they have a mission to, to perform, even when the broader government is, uh, let's say, 
not working in concert with them. It's also, for me as a historian, a lesson about empire. We tend to think about empires as um, sort of all-powerful and, you know, led from the top. But empires in the 19th century were incredibly complicated. And you can have a kind of humanitarianism. I know that word might strike people as, as at odds with, uh, with genocide, but you can have humanitarianism that, that coexists with, with empire, even brutal empire. And so it's, um, I come back to, are there lessons? I don't know that there are lessons, but I think if they could protect people in the 19th century, if Andrew Jackson's government could protect native people in the 19th century, then surely we can do that in the 21st. I guess that's the lesson I, I take from it. Wonderful. Well, this concludes our live Q&A with Dr. Seth Archer, the 2020 Honors Outstanding Professor. On behalf of the Utah State University Honors Program, thank you, Dr. Archer, and thank you all for attending the 45th Annual Honors Last Lecture. See you next year.